Okay. All right, y'all. We are gonna um we are officially live. So do y'all see that little red thing up in the corner? Yes. Yes, I do. Or maybe I just see it on my end. Oh, I, I see it. So y'all will be able to see it. What'd you say, Sandra? I said, I see it. I see it. I'm ready. <laughs> oh. uh, okay. So we'll be able to see. We still have a couple of minutes before four, but I wanted to just um, come on a couple of minutes early to make sure that the broadcast was functioning. And so uh, once people start to join us, you'll see that um, zero go up and it will let us know how many people are here. And so okay. then, we'll, uh, gotcha. then we will get started. So let me um, let me mute my phone. Yeah, let me mute my phone. Hold on. One <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever calls me. I always get a quick text, but I'm muted anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's that's when they call when you're uh, in the middle of a of a Zoom and stuff. So Ex exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Hey, Namba. So Lee Thompson is on, y'all. Welcome, welcome. Thank welcome. you for joining today, Namba. Yes, welcome, welcome. All right, we're going to have a good conversation today. We're going to give um, folks a couple of minutes to log on so we can, um, and then we'll get started. Okay. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thank you. Namba, as you um, come in, if you think others may benefit from this conversation, feel free to share. Or um or like and and uh, we welcome everyone to to come in and participate with us today. Thank you. All right. Welcome, welcome everyone. Oh, thank you, thank you, Number. Number gave us a like. To come in to join us today. Please feel free to say hello to us in the chat or um, wave and let us know that you're here. We would love to welcome you by name. Hey, cuz, hey, Cheryl, how are you? Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so Hi, much. Cheryl. <laughs> We're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. Welcome. Okay. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Cheryl said, hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Can I type in the chat? Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Feel free to type in the chat. Trying to figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you, um, oh, I don't know if um, all of us can type. Okay. Do you see a box at the bottom that says post comment? I don't. Only in the well, oh, the okay. private chat. Oh, okay. Let me I'll see. Type that. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Okay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Chandra, do you have a physical copy of your book with you? Um, I can go grab it. I can go grab it. It's not far. Okay. 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 I just want to make sure to that part that we can um stop talking about it. Okay. So thanks everyone. So far, I see we have some folks who are on um on the live with us. So welcome, welcome. We're gonna get just a couple of minutes. I appreciate you being here. As you come into the room, please feel free to type your name into the chat or wave and let us know that you're here. I'd love to um, make sure we can welcome you by name. So thanks again for being here. I'm excited. We're going to have a great conversation today. Yes, we are. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
All right, so we have some people on, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started because I always promise folks that we'll be mindful of their time. And um, yeah. even for those who come on late, we'll be able to, uh, they'll be able to watch it on uh, YouTube and even um, I'm gonna leave it on uh, Dr. Madeline on the Facebook page. So people will be able to come on and, um, and join in. Thank you, thank you, uh, Lee, for, um, for tagging some people. Um, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's great to see you all here so far. So, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I feel like I've been away for a while, but I'm excited to be back. Uh, and I welcome you all to chat with Dr. Madden. So we're going to get started. I have a, a wonderful panel plan today, and we're going to have a great conversation. So um, sit tight, get a cup of tea or coffee or water, and, um, and join oh, us. And we're going to have some time later on. What'd you say? Oh, I said all wine. We're going to have some time on for questions. Yeah, yes, all wine. <laughs> wine is appropriate. Wine is appropriate. Everybody's grown. Right? Everybody should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so thanks again, all of you, for being here today. I'm Dr. Madeline. I'm your board certified OBGYN, national best selling author from Amazon and international. I love, love, love with busy women, whether they're busy outside of the home or inside of the home, to make sure that they have access to accurate GYN information and birth control so that they can have the most freedom and control over their lives that they desire. That's what it's all about, y'all, freedom and control. So um, this is a chat we're going to have to help expand that notion of freedom and control. And um, to, to have, because this is such an important topic, I really wanted to bring on two people who have just loads of experience and expertise in this area of healthcare, providing healthcare for people, um, women and outside and, and people who are not women. But today we're going to focus on care that they provide for women. So, um, so again, thank you for being here. So again, I'm very excited. We are going to be talking specifically about women's health access and equity. And our talk is going to focus on how we can be a part of the solution. Hey, Esther, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you being here. Today we're going to be talking about uh, how we can all be part of the solutions and how uh, the things that we've seen in our years of providing health care, seeing what we've, questions we might still have, and then some encouragement that we want to give to others who might be thinking about these fields in healthcare. So let me start by introducing my fabulous panel today, okay? Um, so separately, they are powerhouses on their own. And then together, they came together and they found something that's, they found that something that's even more powerful. So I'm going to tell you about uh, Janet Coles and Chandra Brown. So Janet Coles is a BSN RN who has been a nurse for more than 25 years. Janet has both inpatient and outpatient experience. And that's really unique. A lot of pe people don't necessarily cover both areas. She's worked in postpartum care. She's taken care of women and uh, newborn babies. And she's also done high risk OB. And she does it with, uh, with finesse, with passion, and, um, and certainly her clients and patients love when she's around. So um, one of the things she also does as she cares for patients is that she really is a staunch advocate for health. Equity. And so you're gonna hear more about that today when I um, talk some more with Janet. And so, um, also, we have here on the panel, Chandra Brown. Chandra is a family nurse practitioner, also board certified like Janet. And uh, Chandra has worked in this field also for over 25 years. Currently, Chandra is working at a subacute facility that deals with um, uh, addiction for people who have been veterans. And it's great that she takes care of veterans, people who have served our country uh, valiantly. So she is all founder and CEO of Car Talk for Cook which is on Instagram, a little bit more about that. And jointly, Sean and Janet from Black Nurses Corner. And they're going to tell you more about that as well as we go on with this discussion. So I'm so excited to have you both here. Welcome, Janet. Welcome, Chandra. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you for having yeah. us. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, great. And Esther says, wow. Hi, Janet. So happy to see you on the panel. Hi, awesome. Esther. Great to see you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So, um, so again, y'all, we have so much um, expert experience on the panel today. So let's go ahead and get started, all right? So one of the things I like to start with when we have these chats is that we always got to put out the science and the data so that you guys know that we're coming from a place of um, animal stories, 
but the science behind it. Let's talk about it a little bit. So what we know is that still, and this has been for decades, black and brown women in this country have poorer health access and outcomes compared to non-Hispanic white peers. Okay, we have multiple peer reviews studies shown that. Maternal mortality is one example, breast cancer and cancers, and many other disease processes and diagnoses for which women are uh, mostly black and brown women have later access to care and also don't always get the same treatment as some of their non-Hispanic white peers. Okay, so that's um, one of the reasons why we really wanted to talk about this and to try to talk about solutions perspective. What can we do to make this better? So when we look at these disparities and why they've been around for so long, it's important to recognize that they've been around because we're not just talking about individual risk factors, okay? We're talking about stuff that's social and structural. And the social and structural stuff takes longer to, to, um, to rectify, to change. But, you know, hopefully we can chip away at it bit by bit. One of the things that some data is that um, if you look at outcomes for, uh, they looked at some NICU data. And if they looked at outcomes for babies compared to other babies, and, and based on um, which providers took care of them, those babies had better outcomes if they had black and brown nurses and or physicians. That was the case when they looked at NICU data, that was the case when they looked at some maternal health data. And so it's important to understand that data in context. And so we're gonna talk some about that today as well. And um, one of the other things that's been really interesting to see over this last um, year to 18 months is how much these disparities came to uh, be highlighted as we were dealing with COVID-19, as we were dealing with who was mostly affected and disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Again, those were us black and brown folks. Now, yes, it was men and women. When you look at who was affected by like who lost their jobs more and all of that, absolutely it was women hand down, hands down when you look at those data. So um, one other data I want to leave you with, and then I'm going to turn over to Janet and Chandra because I want I have a couple of questions for them and we're going to have a discussion about it. So when we say that we need more providers of color, what does that mean? So when we look at the population in this country, if you just look at Blacks or African Americans, we make up about 13% of the population in this country. When you look at the percentage of nurses who are Black or African American, they make up about 10%. Okay, so that means we have fewer, a fewer percentage point, which means that's a disparity. When you look at who makes up the Black or African American physicians, we make up about 5% of the physicians in this country. Now, that's a huge disparity. So again, we're, we're looking at a situation in which Black and Brown people will be the majority of the population. Um, the data are speculating by 2040 to 2050. And, um, and we don't have enough providers who look like us to care for us and help make sure we get what we need. So um, with all that context, Janet and Chandra, I wanna open up the conversation because um, both of you have just uh, years involved in experience. Hey Renee, thank you so much for being here. I, I appreciate you this, thank you and welcome. So I wanna start there with you both, uh, Janet and Chandra, and each of you please take this question. In your careers, have you been advised to hear these data based on what you see day to day? And have you seen this in your different settings? And if so, could you share some something with us to give us a sense of what you see and also what you think some of the um, some of the things you have seen in terms of solutions? You want to start, Janet? Um, yeah, you know, working in New York, uh, working in Georgia. I've seen a lot um, as, as, in, as far as health care disparities, inequities uh, amongst um, black women, women of color. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular, you know, postpartum care, prenatal care. Uh, we don't have access to adequate prenatal care. Some of us don't. Mm -hmm. And that will in turn kind of make these health care outcomes, poor outcomes for us. Um, in particular, like a patient Patients aren't comfortable, I think, talking to their healthcare providers if they kind of don't look like them or they don't understand where we're coming from. And I think that has a lot to do with like implicit bias from the healthcare provider herself or, or himself. Um, I think if we knock down those walls, implicit bias, uh, that will help better outcomes uh, for our patients. 
in particular, um, black women or women of color. So with that being said, um, I think it's important for us to know that if there is disparities in the world, it's going to spill over to healthcare. So I don't, I think the problem is, is the exposure, the lack of exposure that some of these people have coming into healthcare. Um, not by any means am I saying this, like, um, I, I guess as a slight, but you have, we have a lot of doctors who are not traditionally um, American. They're coming from other places. They're doing their residencies here. They're obtaining all of this knowledge from the United States, but they haven't been exposed to the populations by makeup in the United States. So you have the doctors that are coming from different countries that may have also their own biases and their lack of exposure. Yeah, you know what? I think that's true. Like if you have doctors who are, you know, from every place in the world, which is great. They bring a lot of their experiences with them, but if they if they don't have knowledge of what's going on in our world, I don't think they are capable of treating us um, effectively. And you know, I think that there needs to be a dialogue between patients, doctors, other providers as to what can we do to have better outcomes for, for women of color. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you both for that. And, um, you both kind of touch base on something that I would love for us to expand on some. You talked about implicit bias and those biases are in place. A lot of times I find whether the, um, the provider, the physician or the nurse was born here or born somewhere else, because a lot of times people have ideas based on what they might see in the media or something mm -hmm. else. Um, and it gives them a certain thought about how they should interact with us, especially as people of color. Is that something that you have seen? And I know you have started to do some implicit bias training. Um, what are you guys seeing at your locations as it relates to maybe some people trying to move in with um, implicit bias training and working with different populations of color? Um, well, I think, uh, oh, go ahead, Sean. I'm sorry. You sure? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, for myself, one thing that I have to tell people is, is that the, the biases that they're experiencing or, or, or the biases that they are coming into healthcare with are perpetuated by the same people who have those same biases because of the fact it's, it's, it's a three-way problem. There's not enough of us within healthcare. So when these people come over and their mentors or their guidance is obtained from um, non-white Hispanic people. So they come over here, that's who they mentor with. So some of those biases are kind of um, perpetuated and kind of fueled by what their mentor is saying or what their mentor is experiencing or what they feel themselves. So even with the idea of, of you know, black people not experiencing pain as much as other people, well, you see a lot of providers who perpetuate that same sentiment. So they spill it on to their mentees. So that's kind of like where I'm seeing it. And when they're coming over into um, into our world, women of color, we, we kind of like have this myth of being strong, of being resilient. And that kind of fuels that, that implicit bias that we don't deserve the same quality of care as your traditional damsel in distress that's always perpetuated by your um your caucasian female so they're looking at us differently so that's my take absolutely thank you so much for that chandra and um as you can see so in between i think you can do it from your end as well. Someone commented that they were hearing an echo as each one of us were speaking, and they asked that when those of us who are not speaking, that we cut off our mics. Um, so I did it so that the person could hear Chandra better. So hopefully that allows you guys to hear with um, without the echo. So so thank you for that. Janet, anything to, um, to add? Uh, yeah, I was going to piggyback on Chandra. I was thinking um, before we got on live that how we are perceived as destroyed 
strong black, you know, women, we can do it all, we can handle everything. And, you know, when we kind of voice our complaints to a provider, they may kind of brush it off like, okay, well, you know, she's black woman in America, she's strong, but and we are, but we still need to be heard. We still need our um, concerns and complaints addressed appropriately. And I think that's something that, that, that needs to be done. We need to have our, our concerns addressed. Um, providers need to, like you said, have some kind of training. I think um, at Emory, they are starting a diversity inclusion kind of um, effort going on. And I think I'm going to apply <laughs> to be on to be on that committee. You know, I have a lot to say. It's coming from a background of, you know, I'm an African-American woman and and I can add value to, to that panel. I think. Absolutely. You are um, so right. So right. There are all these different efforts going on. And, um, you know, I, you when you said uh, that, it reminded me of the song. What's that song? I'm Not Your Superwoman. It was written by and sung by a Black woman. And it really has to do with us because we are often perceived, whether it's correctly or incorrectly, as women who can get it all done. And it's, you know, it's um, it's not fair, but it has been perpetuated over decades and centuries in this country. Absolutely. So thank you both for that. So, um, you know, another one of the areas where we see these disparities carry over into is mental health disparities. And this has been something that I think historically communities of color have not necessarily been as engaged in as we have been, I would say over a couple of years. Um, and certainly COVID-19 brought to a head a forefront, to the forefront that there's so much more that we could be doing in terms of mental health. Now, um, Janet, I know a lot of what you do in your day to day is here for women who might be pregnant or postpartum. One of the gap areas that I also see is in postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety and really having gaps in terms of those resources might be available, especially culturally congruent resources. So um, I know that you've been doing a lot of work here in Georgia, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, mental health for pregnant and postpartum women and what you're seeing in terms of uh, progress and what you would suggest. So maybe some lessons learned that could be applied nationally or in other places. Yep, gotcha, Madeline. So yeah, here in Georgia, you know, um, just in general, mental, mental health has been such a taboo subject. In the black community in particular, and then we break it down to black women. You know, like I said, we're strong, we all, all of those things. So having a baby is like, you know, some people think, oh, she had a baby. She's bouncing back. She's fine. Um, I think where some providers may drop the ball is like the Edinburgh scale. If you're if you're scoring high on that, let someone know. Let reach out to the nurse. The nurse. We usually have a lot of um, resources that we can kind of give the patients. But the main thing is to number one screen them because I understand that maybe fifty percent or one in five. I'm sorry, one in five women aren't being screened effectively. Um, and here in Georgia, it's like 13 to 15 percent of women have postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. Um, I would say one thing to look out for, a few things to look out for. If your patient comes in and, and she's saying, you know, Doc, I'm just not myself. I don't, I don't feel right. I'm a little anxious. And it sounds like it's more than postpartum blues. Delve into that. Talk to the patient. Say, hey, listen, you know what? I understand. Let's get you some help. You know, um, there's an organization called Postpartum International society here in Georgia and internationally, they help uh, women who have postpartum issues. They have great resources. Um, here at Emory, we have a resource that we kind of refer patients to. And that brings me to another point. Sometimes your insurance doesn't cover it. Um, you know, sometimes if, if you're living in a rural area, you don't have access to care, period, let alone, you know, mental health issue care that you that you really need that you really need to um, have access to. Um, another thing I was thinking of as um, in the community in, in general, you have sister friends who you can reach out to. If I noticed, you know, my daughter, she had a baby and I noticed she was a little bluesy and there was a lot going on. Listen, are you OK? Let's reach out to one another. Let's not make this such a subject that's so taboo that we can't help each other. We can't support each other. Um, when patients come in, do that depression screening. If they are scoring high, if something's not right, we all have that that intuition where it's like, hmm, something's, something's not right with this patient. I've spoken to patients who they leave the doctor's office, they call the nurse line, and they say, you know what? I didn't feel comfortable talking to the doctor, but 
I've been feeling this way. And I give them all the resources that I, that I have. And if it sounds kind of like she's really on edge, I'm going to make that phone call for her while she's on the phone with me and get her into a program if I have, if I can do that. So I just think it, as it says, as we say, it takes a village. It takes a healthcare village to, to take care of our, our women and our children, you know, wherever the needs may lack. And if it's mental issues, postpartum mood and disorder, anxieties, anxieties, then we need to, we need to get them help. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Janet. You had so many um, pearls in there as you were speaking. Definitely, you know, the, the Edinburgh, for those of you who may be in the audience, is a standard screening tool that we use. We're supposed to use for all pregnant women. And, um, you know, another thing that's happened over the last couple of years is that our professional bodies are trying to expand the time that women get after they deliver a baby. You know, it used to be six and, you know, bounce, no longer even must talk to you. So now we're, you know, people have been working with Congress and different groups have been advocating for that time after delivery to be a full year. Because y'all know it's a lot going on after a lady gives, um, uh, you know, after she births a baby, there's a lot going on. So people need care for a longer amount of time than what we had been traditionally doing. So, um, so Janet, you're absolutely right. Something else you said that's um, really important, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to have both of you on here, because sometimes people think that doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners have an adversarial relationship not at all okay when it comes to the disparities that we're seeing especially as they affect black and brown women this is an all hands on deck situation i say this all the time um because you know it's a whole team of people who are caring for women um pregnant and non-pregnant women but particularly pregnant women teams often consist of you know the nurse the nurse practitioner the midwife the OBGYN physician sometimes a doula if the patient has do well and so um, one of the other messages that I think is important to get out to women is that it's okay to have whoever you want to have involved in your care. It's okay to have as many people as possible involved in your care to make sure you are okay and getting what you need. And that's, um, that's a very important thing as well. So, so thank you for that, that Janet. I'm, I found that um, there are times when patients, I might make a referral to patients. One of the other barriers I found is that we don't have enough providers of color who are doing mental health support. And I think that's an area that um, is slowly expanding as more people engage and people being aware that it's an important need and important gap to fill. But um, I'm glad you're working on that, Janet, because we have a lot of work to do, not only here in Georgia, but I think around the uh, around. Yes, yes, indeed. We have a lot of work to do. And I, you know, I, I'm grateful for opportunities like this to kind of bring it out there, put it out there in the open. And, you know, this conversation helps one person who may be struggling. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm glad. Absolutely. Absolutely, sis. You are so right. Uh, Shantoya, Shantoya Green Wilson. Oh, okay. She um, typed expecting pearls doula support service. Come look at this. Yes, please. By all means, invite other people to join the conversation. Um, if you have resources and later share on the page or others, let us know. Expecting pearls doula support service. Um, you know, we, we're happy to share that information for anyone who might later look at this and be ex um, exploring some doula services. So thank you for that. So, um, excuse me. One of the other things I love about what you guys are doing through Car Talk with Cookie and Black Nurses Corner is that um, you guys are doing a lot of education. OK, you're expanding access through uh, the education that you're providing to, to, to everyone, to anyone who might be within your audience reach. So I wanted to um, ask both of you if, if you could tell us a little bit about your educational things that you're doing. Oh, uh, show, show us that shirt, Chandra. What does that say? Black nurse practitioners matter. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I took off your mic because I wasn't sure if you were. Um, oh, OK. OK. You, you can. Uh, uh, you're ready. But yes. Um, I think you're still muted, Chandra. There we go. Um, oh, I was there getting it is, there is. that my lighting sucks. So I was trying to brighten up my light. So 
But anyway, yes, black nurse practitioners matter. And 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 this is not to like push push um, an agenda, but I want people to understand that um, a lot of people shy away from um, a nurse practitioner and they kind of gravitate towards the physician assistant because they hear the physician part and they kind of get fixated on, um, oh, that he's just like a doctor and they don't use us the same as they could. And I just want people to understand that we're used interchangeably and that being a nurse practitioner means that I can practice on my own. And if you have someone who is a nurse practitioner and they are a um, psychiatric nurse practitioner, they are licensed, hopefully, and board certified to practice on their own. And please utilize them as your mental health resource as well, because it's, it's not enough of us. And a lot of us, women of color, we are gravitating towards the psychiatric part because we realize that there is a big gap in that area. And we're trying to fill that gap and we're trying to attend to the needs of our our community and making sure that we have the resources that we need. So I just wanted to kind of like express how important it is that you utilize your, as we're called, mid-levels as much as possible and, and not be afraid that we may not know as much as the doctor because nine times out of 10, we have a physician as our mentor if we're finding ourselves stumped with a situation and we need some guidance. We have a physician that we can call and ask and say, hey, how can we collaborate and get this person what they need? So please don't shy away from your practitioners. We're, we're here to help too. Absolutely. That's a point, Chandra. And let me ask you to clarify something else that sometimes patient will, patients will ask about. So when, whenever there's a mental health situation, whether it's postpartum or a woman is not pregnant, I always think conversation is a huge part of that before you even begin to talk about medication. Sometimes patients will say, well, I think I need to see the doctor because that's the only person who can write a prescription. But that's been changing in many states, right? Can you um, speak to that a little bit about nurse practitioners and prescribing? So when we apply for our license to be a nurse practitioner, um, along with that license, depending on the facility that we're working, we have we have to have prescriptive privileges because we can write prescriptions, we can write um, mental health um, medications, we can write um, our um, controlled medications if necessary. You know, we try to quote unquote shy away from narcotics or whatever, but sometimes a short course of narcotics is necessary and your nurse practitioner can prescribe that for you. Especially if you've had an episiotomy that was like 24 stitches, you know, to close you up, it, it, you're going to be in some pain. So let's get this woman some, you know, pain control so that she can um, convalesce properly because you're not going to convalesce if your pain is not managed. You're going to lay in the bed. You're not going to do your coughing and deep breathing, and you're going to subject yourself to possibly a pneumonia. So your your nurse practitioners, we can prescribe um, basically what your doctors can prescribe. And if we can't, again, we have that relationship with a physician where we can say, hey, I have a person that's going through X, Y, and Z. Can you look this over for me? Can you help me out? And, and you know, they can help with those prescriptions that we're not privy to, which in most cases isn't much. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for clarifying, clarifying that. I have um, patients ask that question all the time. Again, I want to re reiterate this. I think we all believe that talking it out, at least initially, is where we want to people who need medication and they do better on medication. So just wanted to clarify that for y'all. So um, Chandra, while you have the mic, tell us a little bit about Car Talk for Cookie and how you use that to educate and entertain. You know, um, edutainment is the, the word, the official word, I believe, for it. And you do a great job of doing that. Tell us about Car Talk with Cookie. And then both of you tell us, please, about um, Black Nurses Corner. So Car Talk with Cookie is, um, Cookie is my nickname. And that concept was derived from the fact that I, I wrote a book and it's about workplace etiquette. And I had a girlfriend tell me, 
you need to talk about what you wrote about because you have so much to say and you really drop gems on people and you help people understand not just you know the medical world because my car talks are general i just talk about corporate america period so i came up with this car talk with cookie and i use it to educate people and to help provide a platform for work etiquette and give them strategies on how to navigate white privilege in the workplace, which is kind of what my book is based upon. And it's the Black Professionals Guide, How to Navigate White Privilege in the Workplace. And it's not a um, it's, it's not a, a point the finger at other people. It's to take accountability for what we don't know. And I'm giving people a foundation to understand what goes on behind the scenes in corporate America. So Car Talk with Cookie, it's a little colorful and it's a lot of frank language. But I think that's how you kind of get people's attention by bringing things to a level that we can all understand. And it's a level of realism. And I'm, I, I tell people I'm, I'm not everybody's flavor because I do swear. And it's more so for effect as opposed to message. So I, I give people the real so that they'll understand that I'm not somebody telling you, um, basically, you need to do this. I'm telling you what they're expecting us not to know. So. That's my car talk. And I am funny. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. I definitely have seen some of your posts on IG. Definitely um, educational and entertaining at the same time. And um, I must say, you know, for, for anyone in our audience who might be listening, this, this ability to navigate this corporate world, it's an ongoing lesson. I'm still learning. And so you know, when, when Cookie is on IG and giving different tips and pearls, there's always something that I pick up and I try to take with me, whether it's for myself or whether it's for something that one of my mentees might be going through. And maybe she says it in a way that might cut to the chase a little bit better. Because sometimes we do have to cut to the chase. We do have to, have to be real. If not us for us, then who? You know, and sometimes we can say it to each other in a way that others can. Esther, yes, I can appreciate the real. Amen, Esther. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for that, uh, Chandra. And now um, Janet and Chandra together started Black Nurses Corner. Again, um, with the, 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 the notion being that when you can educate people, when people can have access to information in a way that is digestible, it doesn't feel like overwhelming to them, sometimes it can stick and resonate a little bit better. So um, I applaud you both uh, for Black Nurses Corner. I, I see the posts every now and then, and it, it's really doing a great job of just health nuggets, not just for women, but for men as well, for, for young people. So tell us a little bit about Black Nurse Corner and how that got started and, and um, why you also agree that education is something that can help toward health equity. Um, I actually woke up one day and I said, Janet, um, I text her. I said, Janet, we need to start an IG page where we're educating people and we're giving people some tools in order to navigate healthcare system. So I said, I don't really see a lot of um, education. I see people, you know, they're pushing their own agenda on um, IG as opposed to a global agenda. And a lot of people may shy away from the fact that it's called Black Nurses, but we are Black nurses. And this is our world that we're using to educate people. So we came together and initially we started off with a topic and we would use that topic and kind of like give daily nuggets about it. We would, you know, we, we started off with like, I think it was um, why it's important to have a colonoscopy, um, hypertension. And, you know, we would just give people like just pointed ideals as, as to, how to manage your hypertension, what questions you should be asking, what you should be paying attention to, and how you should go about, you know, managing and controlling. We tell people, I am not your provider. These are just tips to take to your provider to get more clarification as to what's being done to you, to help you be a better advocate for yourself. So with that being said, um, Janet, you know, she started um, going back to school and I started, you know, wrapping up my book and we kind of let the platform get away from us. But 
I try to post something every week to keep people engaged, to let them know, hey, we're still here until we can kind of get together and say, now, how are we going to go about this? How are we going to rebrand ourselves? So Janet, I'll let you talk some more about that too. All right. Thanks, Chandra. So yeah, Chandra, like she said, you know, she texted me and um, I was, you know, I had feelings of trepidation at first. I'm like, well, you know, I like to play the background. I'm not quite sure if I want to go out in public like that on IG, but, you know, it's about education. And when, you ha when you're educated about different topics, you know, medical topics, diabetes, high blood pressure, like she said, anything, colon cancer, anything, um, pregnancy, newborn care, anything like that, you want to have the education and um, it makes you more informed and you can be more of an advocate for yourself. That's the way I see it. So um, sometimes, you know, you may not, like I said, you may not be comfortable asking your doctor. You may not have that rapport, which if you don't, you need to find a doctor that you have rapport with. But um, in the meantime, you know, we're here to, to answer the questions. Don't be with the providers, but, you know, we have a wealth of knowledge and we want to give that knowledge, you know, to our our viewers so um with that being said education 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 ask us anything we want to we want to give you these these pearls of wisdom in our own humorous way because like sean just said yeah we are pretty funny <laughs> and um and when you when you get into kind of like a joking matter you tend to to internalize it and you're gonna be gonna remember yeah jenna said i need to get my you know i need to get my booty check yeah i need to get my you know my lady parts check yeah you're gonna you're gonna remember that so this is what we're here for education so you can be your, the best advocate you can be in terms of your of your health care Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love it. That's um, so important. I think we also have been seeing that during this COVID pandemic, like really making the opportunity to get as much accurate information out there as possible, because there are so many competing platforms where people are giving misinformation. I know you guys have been seeing that as well. And so, you know, putting out stuff that's linked to science and data and facts and, and really trying to say, hey, you know, even if you have a clarifying question, like no question is silly. But, um, you know, there are so many conspiracy theories out there and stuff. It's, it's important to have platforms like yours. So so thank you both for for um, for doing what you do. If you guys, as you're watching, have any questions, I'm free to type them in the chat. Let me just catch us up with a couple of comments. NG, as fire to shine, said, yes, this is so necessary for the community. Kudos. Founder, CEO said, great job. Thank you so much, uh, Angie. Thank you so much, uh, John. Cassie, lab. Uh, something uh, was uh, was funny, and Cassie also said, "I love Black Nurses Corner a lot, and they are funny." Absolutely, Cassie, I feel the same. When I see a Black Nurses Corner post, it um, it definitely gives me something to think about in a different way, and I and I smile and and laugh as well. Lorraine Robertson says, "Love it." So um, so thank you all for your comment for for joining us today. If you have any comments or, or questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. So I want to turn to something else. And Chandra started to talk a little bit about her book earlier. But um, before I get to the book, I want to just talk broadly about some things that were happening during this pandemic and probably maybe um, a couple of months being in the pandemic as we would do with really a lot of uh, real discourse going on in this country, really trying to empower women, not just with health information and accurate health messages, but also self-love and how you might feel about yourself compared to some of the negative messages that are out there in the world for, um, for women, particularly women of color. So one of the things that I was really impressed about was um, one day I was on social media and um, I saw Janet had posted something and just, just for some background context, I've known Janet since we were 14 years old. So we, we go way back. And I saw Janet post this thing. I was like, wow, I hadn't thought of that before, but we are that. And we are what she called blasonic, okay? And so Janet, when we were kind of, when there was a lot going on in the world and a lot of women were feeling some type of way, she came up with this word that basically, I think, really embodies self-love and empowerment. So Janet, tell us more about your word and um, and when will we see t-shirts, sis? Right? Yes, black side. Yes, t-shirts coming soon. I have to, you know, partner with someone, you know, it has to be the right partnership, but definitely we will all have our black exotic t-shirts on one day. So um I think it was Chandra and I, we were talking about um 
Lil Wayne and 50 Cent and how they were saying, you know, we want an exotic looking woman. And I'm thinking, well, what's that? Because black women come in all different hues. You know, what do you mean by exotic? And, and I think it was kind of ignorant and a little disrespectful and hurtful that they would say things like that and their own mothers <laughs> look like us or, you know, what have you. So um, I just wanted to uplift us as, as women, women of color. Listen, we're beautiful. We're brown, black, whatever, you know, high yellow as they used to be back in the day. We have a variety of hues and we are all beautiful whatever whatever hue you you know you are embodying that you know we're all beautiful so um i just wanted to to put that out there like you know what that's this kudos to us as black women as women of color you know we can't let these men out there who are kind of self-hating they don't really love themselves come tell us the standard of beauty no we we are beautiful this brown skin this chocolate skin is, is is beautiful and it's not to say that you can't have a preference for something because hey i like more of a chestnut dark chocolate sexy guy i like drake too like you know they're they're both fine so if my preference is for something i get that but i'm not going to negate a whole community a whole different a whole human color because you know, I'm ignorant. So, you know, that's why I put Black Sonic out there. And it just kind of came to me just like that. I was telling Shonja, I was like, oh, Shonja, I was congratulating on her book. And I said, Shonja, you is smart. You is beautiful. And I wrote, you is Black Sonic. She was like, Black Sonic, what's that? I'm like, okay, I have something here. So we are all Black Sonic and I love it. T-shirts coming soon, guys. <laughs> awesome, awesome. But I love it. It's uh, such an empowering message. So, so thank you for that. I remember some of those um, clips with uh, 50 Cent when that, all that was going on. And it was like, huh? But I, I love it. We are Black women and we are exotic. And there's no separation between exotic. I love it. I love it. Um, Cheryl said, this is an important discussion of reality that some don't think exists. Yes. Um, so true, uh, Cheryl. I'm, I'm glad you're here listening to it. I'm glad you've joined us. And I'm glad that all of you are here so we can have this discussion. And, you know, we're happy to have more if you guys have common questions or um, want some more information. Angie, for, as far as shine, says, Black Sided. Yep. And by Jane Coles. <laughs> so, so thank you all. Um, in terms of, um, like, writing and getting information, Oh, yeah. And Shantoya says, Black Zodic, more little girls need to hear that message. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like Janet said, you know, we come in all these beautiful shades of brown and, and black, um, light to all the way dark. And um, and many of us don't hear that message enough. Now, as a, as a dark brown girl, you know, it was a message that I had to believe more and more for myself as I got older. But I think the earlier we give our little girls these messages, the better it will be and the more they can feel self-love empowered with everything that's going on. So thank you for that comment. So um, one of the other things that, that was going on in terms of educating and getting messages out there and really trying to protect, you know, I started this, um, this talk by talking about, you know, 10% of nurses are, are black, 5% of physicians are black. And so when we're those percentages, there are some spaces in the healthcare world where there are not many of us. And sometimes it's challenging to know, okay, um, how do I navigate this? Is this a landmine? I'm not really sure if this is a landmine because I haven't experienced this before. And so um, Chandra wrote this just wonderful book. I was able to um, see it a couple of months ago. And uh, it, it really, it, it does what it says it's going to do. It helps you navigate this world in case you're working in areas where there is white privilege. And I, I mentioned this topic because part of the solution, as we talk about health equity, women's access and all of that, and as we talk about the fact that people, black and brown communities do better, there are more black and brown providers caring for them, then we have to also figure out how we sustain ourselves in these environments if we're choosing to go into them if there aren't many of us, how do we sustain ourselves? So Chandra, tell us um, a little bit about your book and why you wrote it. And I know you gave us a little bit about it before, but um, uh, if you can show us the cover and just let us know in case others have questions, how they can access it. Okay, so this is the cover. 
The Black Professional's Guide, How to Navigate White Privilege in the Workplace. And um, it's not privy to healthcare. This is really a book that strategically breaks down some of the pitfalls that we encounter when we're in the workplace, be it um, the healthcare field, corporate, financial. It's a, it's a global guide. It's a global foundation for what many of us may not have, and that's behind the scenes work etiquette. And so it, it, it cautions people to take accountability for what they don't know, as far as um, some of the things that corporate America kind of um, hides their hands about, you know, um, why is it that we don't have the same um, privileges that um, say Sally may have or, or Kevin or Karen? And I want people to understand that part of it is, is, is accountability. We have to have accountability, but not accountability for the things that they do, the accountability for the things that we do that we don't know they're watching us for. So it's not a point the finger book. It's delivered with a lot of humor, but also very succinctly because it's not a long book. It's 140 pages and it even has a glossary for some of the um, noun terms that we use and also some of the resources that we may need if we find that we have been caught up in what I call um, corporate hunger games. So um, you can get it from my personal landing page, which is Chandra'sPlace.com. Um, I will autograph it for you or you can get it from Amazon. And um, Dr. Madeline, she, she has read it. Um, Janet has read it. And I haven't had really any bad reviews. I even had um, a couple of my Trump supporting friends read it and they couldn't really find fault with it. They were like, you know, it made me take accountability for the things that I may have done in the workplace that I may not have realized that I've done. And, you know, I tell them when they get defensive about the title, we can have a conversation after you read the book. So that's why a couple of them read the book because they wanted to refute everything that I said, but couldn't find fault in it. You know, of course they're going to pick apart some things, but they couldn't find fault with it. So that was my why. That was my how. My um, my why is is because I found myself being caught up in some white privilege, and ironically, the person who I encountered with this issue, she use mental health as her defense as to why she acted the way she did. And the company that I worked for backed her up and she stayed and I am someone who knows my worth. So I left. And that's one of the chapters in the book to know your worth, because if, if you feel that you are, um, you have to stay somewhere that you can't move, that you you need to be there, be it for your um, pension or be it for um, the benefits, then you don't know your worth. And you you need to kind of figure it out because I've never believed in staying someplace where I'm not wanted. I'll do I'll do like um, Dr. Um, Dr. Hannah did. I'll, I'll, I'll leave UNC and I'll go to Howard. So that's the way I looked at it. So true. Thank you so much for that, Chandra. Thank you. Yes, the book is um, it's a great, great, quick read. And um, I highly encourage if there are those of you who are having challenges in your workplace environment, like Chandra said, even if it's not uh, health care, it's, um, it's important read to kind of give you some different context and different perspective. And let me see. Oh, Esther said in Big Girls too. Yes. And we were talking a little bit about self-love and loving your skin, whatever shade of brown you're in. Yes. And Big Girls too. I had said Little Girls, but you're right. Big Girls too, Esther. And Dr. Deborah's here. Hi, hi, Dr. Deborah. Thank you so much for joining. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Sharon is on uh, a sister from um, Georgetown. She's also in the healthcare field. She says, great discussion. And uh, Deborah said yes to something that you were saying, Sandra. So, so, so amen to that, definitely. Um, Angie's Aspire Shine, that book is just in time in today's culture. Absolutely. Necessary Conversations would be a great book club discussion, especially the part about knowing your worth. Amen to that. Amen to that. I don't know if y'all read the full statement by Dr. Hannah Jones. Um, Chandra mentioned she's the, um, the person who decided not to accept UNC's offer when they finally came through and then she went to Howard and said, but that full statement, I'm going to tell you all right now, it's a testimony. 
if y'all find it and read it today, it'll count for church. Okay, that's how, <laughs> that's how serious that uh, that full statement is. It, I read parts of it and I was like, yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, can so I, I say encourage you if you have it? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. I just want to say this for for those people who feel that they have the corporate world on lock and they don't need a guide. This would be a good book for your college, your high school, your newbie too. So you, we we assume that our children know how to deal with privilege, but when my daughter and her friends read the book, they were like oh my gosh, I didn't even think about this. I didn't know about this. So don't just assume that it's just for people at this big age. It might be for your newbie too, to give them some tools. Yeah, Chandra, I agree. Yeah. You know, I have Jair reading it. Um, you know, he's trying to enter the, the workforce of with a CPA, accountant. So you, we already know he has hurdles to jump. <laughs> so, you know, I thank you for writing that book. I'm sure he's going to put it to great use. And, you know, it's an awesome book. Everybody go out and get it and read it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mentioned because we're healthcare workers, I mentioned the small percentages in the healthcare field, but these percentages are low across the board, unfortunately. So in accounting where um, Janet's son is going into, you know, where he's going, um, and film where my son is going, it's, it's across the board. And so um, I, I'm glad, Chandra, that you wrote the book. I enjoyed reading it. And you nothing but to continue to get the word out there to try to save as many young folk, young and grown folks, because some grown folks need the information in that book as well. So, um, so thank you for writing it. Renee said, know your worth, exclamation. Amen, Renee. You, you, you already know, sis. She said, LOL, worth. I'm driving speed text. Oh, no, you're good. I know it's meant. Esther said, I'm going to need a few copies of that book to pass out at the courthouse. I hear you, girl. I hear you. I am going to type in the chat, um, chandrasplace.com, for those of you um, who might be interested. And Hope says, hello. Hey, Hope, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you being here. So, um, so I wanted to make sure we talked about that. So before we close out for today, and this has been um, just a great talk, y'all. But one of the things I really wanted us to um, talk about is this notion of, so how do we increase that 5%? How do we increase that 10% of this workforce? How do we get more of us into these healthcare fields if we know that seeing more of us is going to make a difference, especially in terms of women's health access and equity? And so each of us has had a different path um, in this road to healthcare. Um, my path is, is one thing, um, and you both had different. And I want to make sure that you have a chance to tell your stories, tell you about your paths, because you might be speaking to someone who it was thinking about it, think that their path could match, or they didn't, they thought maybe it had to be absolutely positively one way and didn't know that there are other ways to navigate a path. So, um, Janet, let me start with you, please. Um, let us know about your path to being to having a bachelor's of science in nursing and being a registered nurse board certified. OK, so my path um, started off maybe 25 years ago. Um, I had my daughter, Kiara. She had like heart issues and I had to stay home and take care of her. I had dropped in a few colleges, got credits here and there and everywhere and couldn't kind of decide what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to, I wanted to be in the healthcare setting. Wasn't quite sure what that looked like. Um, I saw how the nurses took care of my daughter. I'm like, you know what, I can do this. I can go into nursing. Got an associate's degree in nursing, passed my LPN boards midway through nursing school, worked as an LPN for a second, passed my RN boards, um, worked for a really long time before I decided to go back to school, get that bachelor's degree. Chandra, yes, thanks for encouraging me. Um, became board sort of certified before that in ambulatory care. So my love is OB, but I'm in the ambulatory care setting. So I, I, I love OB, I know OB, I've done it for years. Ambulatory care, not that long. So I decided to get certified, board certified in ambulatory care. So that means, yes, I can take care of women and babies, but I can take care of those stinky old men too. <laughs> so, you know, I, I could take care of anything that walks through the door basically. So that's what I chose to do. Um, bachelor's degree. I went to online school. Um, I said, you know what? The time is right. Kids are grown. 
I have all this time. I still have the knowledge. I need some of these alphabets behind my name to do what I want to do and take it to the next level. Let my job pay for it. <laughs> and um, and here I am with this bachelor's degree, RN and, 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 and board certified. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for that, I, I love hearing about different people's paths because um, undoubtedly there's someone in the audience who, who is thinking, oh, no, I can't, I can't, I can't, or, you know, maybe my time has passed. And I love each of our stories is so unique because it really gets to show people, hey, you know, there's always a path. You can carve your own path and you can still get to do something that you love and enjoy with passion and make a difference because uh, each one of us does this with me some of this health equity stuff so so thank you thank you for sharing it for doing all that you do Sandra okay so <clears throat> today I was with my niece and she is going into her sophomore year at DePaul University um, full scholarship and she was thinking about law but she's working as a certified nursing assistant and she said to me she said auntie she said um Tell me about being a nurse practitioner because I was talking to one of the nurses and she's an LPN going for her iron and she told me that I would make a good LPN. And I said, a good LPN, why not an iron? And I was like, oh, wait a minute, let me guess. She's white, right? And my niece, she kind of giggled. She said, well, why do you say that? And I said, because why would you make a good RN or a good MP? There's no way you could possibly be equal to or higher than her. So she's going to put you at this pedestal, at this level below her. So she was like, auntie, you always think to the left. And I said, no, I read between the lines, honey. That's what it is. So she's thinking about going into healthcare. So she wants to know how can she fund it? So I told her, I said, well, the VA has this wonderful program that if you're working there and you want to go to nursing school, they will pay for you to go to nursing school and you will get a paycheck. And all you have to do is work a couple of days a semester and you will get your regular paycheck, but you owe them two years after you graduate. Now, I have a lot of um, medical secretaries who have taken advantage of this, a lot of LPNs who have taken advantage of this, and they look like me. So they come in there and they have an agenda and they're smart about it because they don't want to be inundated with these student loans. So when I was in nursing school, I, I went to a private Catholic nursing school. The only black nurse student there and a single parent. So there would be days where I had to bring my daughter to school with me. And trust me, the dean of my school was a nun. So that in itself was like this single parent is, and she's black and she's like bringing her daughter to school day. So it, it was crazy for me, but I had to do what I had to do. I had to grind it out. I wanted a better life for my daughter and for myself. And we had career day and I always knew I wanted to be a nurse practitioner. And on career day, we had a nurse practitioner speaking. And of course she zones in on me and she says, so what do you want to do when you graduate? And I said, well, I'm going to be a nurse practitioner. And she said, oh, you want to be a nurse practitioner? And I said, no, I'm going to be a nurse practitioner because my grandmother told me never let somebody tell you what you want to do. You make sure you tell them what you're going to do. You speak it into existence. And her eyes got really big and she was like, oh, okay. So here we are 24 years later and I'm a nurse practitioner and my role was not easy. I had a car accident while I was at Georgia State University and I was in a wheelchair for almost a year and um, I had a hip repaired and I had to have a hip replacement and I had to have a revision and I had this and I had that. And it took me an incredibly long time from the time when I started until when I finished, 14 years to be exact, but I did it. So anybody can do this and I encourage them to do this. And I don't wanna influence my niece, but I want her to consider healthcare. I think she's smart enough to go a different route. I think she's smart enough to go the physician route. I just, I think it's the length of time that's deterring her. And I don't want that to be a deterrent because regardless of the fact that we can do almost everything that a physician can do, I am not a physician. And we need, we need our physicians of color because we need that mentorship. So that's important to have that mentorship. So that's why I'm happy to be on this platform. And I'm hoping that when she gets a chance, she'll come back and she'll watch it 
she's on a boat right now, my niece, and she'll say to herself, I can do this and I will do this. So thank you for having us. Oh, and both so much, um, such inspiring journeys. Um, I, I knew the big picture stuff, but I didn't know all the details. And so I am inspired, I'm um, in awe, and I just am thankful for all that you went through to get to where you are, that you persevered, that you had tenacity, and that you continue to serve with the passion with which you serve um, by educating on your platforms, with what you do every day in your clinical settings. So, um, so thank you, thank you from the bottom of my, my heart. And thank you so much for being here. And Esther said, wow, Chandra, you are awesome. What a journey. Awesome. And Esther also said, very inspiring, Janet. Excellent. And Andy said, these two women put action behind the words. Andy needs so many more platforms such as this. Thank you all for sharing today. You are so welcome, Angie. So welcome. Cassie said, yes, read between the lines. That's when you were talking about your niece, Chandra. And Angie put um, postpartum.net website that has some postpartum mental health materials, I believe, Janet, uh, or, or Angie. I believe yeah. that's uh, what that has. That's what that is. You, okay. She's part of the postpartum international support um, uh, program that I spoke about. So she's she's on board with this as well. So one thing we have to have her on this panel too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, we can never talk enough about mental health support needs for um, pregnant and postpartum women. So I would be happy to do that. Lorraine said, love you ladies, knowledge is power. Mwah. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, so here we are at 503 and Theodore Cortez Wilson says, thank you for being on Black Zod and smart examples to our black and brown communities. Thank you so much, Theodore. Thank you. That's um, a wonderful statement. And we just we, we thank you for being here. And we're excited and thankful to be here as strong black exotic women <laughs> and smart women. Thank you so much. So um, Janet and Chandra, I'm going to ask you if either one of you have any closing words and then we're going to wrap it up. I think you guys have had a really good reception today. I'd love to have Black nurses back another time to talk about something else in the future. Um, if you're interested. So again, thank you both. Let me um, turn it over to y'all for any closing remarks. Well, thank you for having us, Madeline. You are an inspiration to us both, I think. Um, we see you out here doing your thing. You're, you're, you're branding yourself. You, you are brilliant. I think one of the most brilliant women I've ever met in my life, but humble as well. So I just want to thank you for having us. Um, if there's anyone out there who's interested in healthcare, whatever road you may, it may lead you to, whether it be associates, bachelors, MD, PhD, whatever you want, FMP, whatever you want to do, you can do it. I think Chandra and I are perfect, perfect examples of you put your mind to do something, we're gonna get it done. We call it our Libra projects, but you know, we we, we get it done and we just wanna, you know, be mentors to, to to other young young women out here of color, letting them know that you know, you can do whatever you want to do out here in the world. Just you know, just keep trucking along and that's my message for today. Just just do what you want to do and put your mind to it and you can do it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. So what I want to say is, is that um, we, we have to come together as women, and as, as a people, in order to make sure that, number one, our voices are heard. Number two, talking about the stigma of mental health, that we're in constant advocacy for the dispelment of that stigma. And, and number three, I want us to at least have a responsibility to offer mentorship when we can and not get to the point where we're eating our young because that's one of the most toxic statements I've ever heard about nursing is that we eat our young. And I have, been like just a firm believer in I want somebody that cares as much as I do to take care of me when I get to be to the point where I'm in a hospital or when I'm in need of care. So that's why I, I came up with the idea that we're going to lead with care. And that means when we're educating, when we're caring for our patient population, and also when we're mentoring. So we're going to lead with care. So that's that's one of the, the mission statements for Black Nurses Corner to lead with care. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, I don't think I can say it any better than you ladies. Uh, so I'm not going to add much to that. I'm going to thank you both for being here. I'm going to thank our audience. We have a couple of more comments. Um, Esther said, excellent and much needed discussion. Thank you all for the difference that you are making and welcome to make. Dr. Deborah said, thank you ladies for speaking out about this very important topic. We can do anything we put our minds to. Absolutely, Dr. Deborah. And Penelope said hello from Scotland. Welcome, welcome. I don't think that we've had um, an audience member from Scotland before. So welcome, thank you for being here. So um, I'm just gonna close out. I mean, this, this issue of women's health access and equity is, is crucial. It's the thing that drives me, my passion for um, this women's health work. It's the reason that I chose OBGYN. It's the reason why I wanted to have these fabulous sisters on here today, because this is, is again an all hands on deck situation. And so whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in another lane, you know, we talked a little bit about social and social determinants. There's something that all of us can do in our various settings that can make the road a little bit easier for a sister, you know, a black or brown person, whether they're in your immediate circle or whether you're gonna help someone else. Just want to encourage all of you and thank you again for being here. Deborah, Dr. Deborah says, Chandra Jones, I plan to buy your book. Awesome, Dr. Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, Chandra will be able to see it when you go to that website. And Hope says, I'm going to share this video with my CNA students. Thank you so much, Hope. Thank you. As, as much as possible, we want to be resources for folks. Um, Janet and I both mentioned mentoring. And um, I think all of us do some mentoring. One of the things that's important, I say this to mentee all the time, don't be shy about emailing more than once, about calling more than once. We get so busy. And because we're part of like the 5% or the 10%, we might get busy and it might take us, us a little bit longer, but we absolutely want to be a resource to whoever think that they need to, um, to reach out and get some mentoring, okay? So never be discouraged. Always follow up more than once, twice, three times. It doesn't matter. Um, and just um, make sure you get what you need, okay? So I appreciate all of you being here today. It was a wonderful discussion. Jen, thank you all so much. I am just grateful that y'all are you, Madeline. today. And of course, of course. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to when we come back. We'll have to have you guys back in, um, in a few months and talk about the next bit. And I got a lot of questions in my inbox about COVID and the Delta variant and vaccines and what people should do. We might have to come back and speak about that too. So, <laughs> so um, thanks everyone. I'm going to end the broadcast now. I'm Dr. Madeline, your board certified OGN, international speaker, published author. I love making sure that busy women, whether they're busy inside of the home or outside of the home, have access to accurate GYN information and birth control access so they can have as much freedom and control as they need. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to, um, if you missed this broadcast live, it'll be on my Dr. Madeline MD Facebook page. It'll also be on my YouTube channel, which is also Dr. Madeline MD. So follow my YouTube channel and uh, join us back here for other topics on future Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern. Thank y'all. Love you.